Good. Good afternoon and welcome to the National CAC webinar series. My name is Meredith Kirkland Burke and I am a social worker and a forensic interviewer um, at, from the uh, SCAM program at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, Ontario. Um, so today we're going to spend um, a bit of time talking about what we know forensic interviewers may require after initial training to uh, both maintain and improve the quality of their forensic interviewing skills. So that being said, I, I suspect the um, webinar may be of interest to those who are forensic interviewers, um, those actually in the room with the kids doing the interviews, and may also be of interest to professionals who are responsible for issues of quality assurance and professional development in, in your various um, centers, communities, and CACs. Um, I did a webinar about a month ago. <laughs> I had so much material, I really had to race through it. But today, um, we have a little less uh, material, so I suspect we may be through the um, material in some, some pretty decent time, and um, um, there'll be opportunity at that point for questions, discussions, uh, and comments. So what I hope to do is to initially talk about, not in great length um, in, or in great detail, um, but I want to look at the research to see what it tells us about what forensic interviewers might, might require post-initial training. Um, and after having a look at that, understand what options might be available for forensic interviewers. Um, peer review, supervision, consultation, self-review. I want to look at all those options and some of the advantages and disadvantages of those various approaches. And then uh, I'm going to basically talk about um, an experiment here in Toronto. I guess I can't call it really an experiment, but this is an, a new initiative over the last couple of years where I've been involved in developing a peer review program for forensic interviewers here at the Toronto CYAC um, and have some discussion about, um, you know, bumps along the way, questions we had to answer and, and certainly some lessons learned two years uh, uh, over, the la over the last two years. And then I was quite hopeful that um, for the sites that are logged on to the call, um, at the end I was hoping that we could go site to site and perhaps people could give um, the group some information with respect to how they are approaching this issue in their particular community. Um, and if so, again, lessons learned um, or suggestions for other people who might be at different stages of uh, tackling or responding to this particular issue. So um, keep that in mind, and when we get there, hopefully you'll be uh, be able to share um, with group. Um, so I also want to just acknowledge that we all likely come out of or in communities that have decided to set up forensic interviewing models in different ways. Um, I know just from some contacts across the country, for instance, that there are particular CACs who have developed a more designated forensic interview approach or a more specialized forensic interview approach where there are a small group of highly trained individuals who are conducting the interviews and they're being conducted on behalf of the investigators. So they're typically, these people are doing three, four, five forensic interviews in any given day, uh, but not completing the other parts of the investigation. Um, and then I know other communities are approaching this from more a generalist uh, point of view or, uh, you know, sort of a jack of all trades point of view where there are, um, you know, a larger group of interviewers, typically child welfare workers or police officers who conduct the forensic interviews with the children 
um, on behalf of the CAC, but are also involved in all the other aspects of the investigation. So they're going to do the parent interviews. Um, CAS is going to be responsible for making the child protection decisions and apprehending, if so, writing the affidavit, finding the foster home, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then um, I think it's fair to say that there are probably communities that have a mix of these two different approaches, sort of a hybrid interviewer approach where uh, there may be perhaps in a smaller community one interviewer with uh, who's more sort of highly trained and experienced and so he or she will do a large part of the interviewing but they also have the role to complete uh, the other aspects of the investigation. So um, certainly there's advantages and disadvantages to both these types of approaches. Uh, but the point I, I want to make is that depending on the model you have in your community, likely the needs around um, peer review or supervision or consultation will will be slightly different. And there's not necessarily, there's sort of no one size that, uh, that will fit all. Um, I've had uh, the opportunity to meet with some of the forensic interviewers from the Snowflake Center in Winnipeg, so I understand Winnipeg's sort of gone more the designated or specialized forensic interviewer model, and please uh, correct me if I'm wrong, really Calgary's taken a similar approach. Here in Toronto, um, the approach is more generalist, uh, where there are uh, 15 or 16 police officers and about the same number of child welfare workers who uh, do both the forensic interview and, and the uh, rest of the interview, or investigation, sorry. So, this is a quote taken out of a soon to be published or may have just been published uh, article by Karen Sawitz and Tom Lyon and Gail Goodman where they indicate 30 years of empirical research on interviewing of children brings us close to consensus on basic child forensic interview strategies. So regardless of whether or not you're in a community with a specialized forensic interviewing model or a generalist or some hybrid form, what we do know in the forensic interviewing field, or where we have come anyway, is, as they say, close to consensus. So we have a fairly good idea and we have fairly good consensus on what a best practice forensic interview should look like. That is much less up in the air than it was 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. So what a best practice forensic interview looks like is not the topic for today. If people um, have not had an opportunity to, to participate in two previous webinars, I would suggest uh, having a look at them to, um, you know, have a good sort of sense of um, what this close to consensus looks like. So Dr. Sonia Brubacher did a, a webinar on January 17th. Uh, forensic Interviewing of Children, Basic Principles, and then I did an inter uh, webinar on January 26th talking about conducting developmentally sensitive forensic interviews with kids. So if somebody is um, new to the field, new to child abuse investigations, um, typically um, uh, children's aid workers, child welfare workers, police officers will do some initial training uh, program. Um, some of it might be uh, based in their service, some of it might be based in their particular agency, uh, but typically if people are going to have responsibility to do forensic interviewing, there is um, some opportunity for that particular professional to do some initial training in forensic interviewing. I put a list up here on this particular slide, certainly not an exhaustive list in any way. Um, APSAC, NCAC, and Tom Lyon, of course, are all U.S.-based um, training programs. Um, the CCAC is offering a, an online advanced practice in forensic interviewing. Um, and then from province to province and community to community, um, there, there are often training programs available. In, in Ontario, for instance, um, most police officers uh, uh, city police officers as well as our provincial officers are trained through our Ontario Police College. 
um, in Toronto um, because of, I, I believe, the size of the city, um, uh, Toronto Police Service and Children's Aid jointly run um, forensic interview training for um, the Toronto-based people. Um, so again, every um, every sort of area might have something different to offer. Um, and bottom line is these initial training programs can look different. They can be classroom-based. We've moved more recently to more online formats. Um, some of them are kind of capitalizing on what we think might be a better way to for people to retain information and it's uh, spaced learning. Um, so there are modules spread over time that people participate in. And of course, they'll have various expectations around mock interviews or practice-based work as well as exam requirements, et cetera. The question really that I wanted to talk about today was, okay, what happens after training? Um, I don't think um, there is such a thing as a professional forensic interviewer uh, student. <laughs> we all have to stop going to training at some point and start doing the work and start doing the interviewing. Um, and that raises the question of, okay, after my week-long training, after my three days training, after my nine-day training at the Ontario Police College, um, I go back, I start doing this work, how am I going to make sure that I'm maintaining and hopefully improving my skill? I was talking to a colleague who uh, is a police officer here in Toronto, and I, I was trying to think of some kind of parallel example. So he was telling me that um, once a year, the uh, every Toronto police officer has to re-qualify for um, firearm usage. and. Um, he made the comment that, uh, I, I mean, obviously the responsibility around having a firearm, the liability and so forth is humongous, but he also made the point that it's quite rare for them to actually need to, to use their firearm over the course of the year. Um, and so each officer has to do uh, target tests, shooting drills, there's a classroom component where they have to be updated on any legislation or policy. They get put into actual scenarios to decide about using their weapons or not. Um, and then usually there's a particular focus on a particular issue. And he explained that for this year, it's going to be, this is three days of training. And uh, then I asked him about the child abuse, the initial training he did around child abuse investigations and investigative interviewing. And he indicated that he had done the course um, a number of years ago and um, he he is clear that he doesn't have to re-qualify or take any sort of further training beyond that initial training. Even if he decided to go to the fraud squad for five years and then come back, he, he wouldn't need to re-qualify with respect to conducting forensic interviews or competing health investigations. You may pick up on the fact that I'm going to take a little bit of issue with that. So just to move on, what the research tells us so this was a study done quite some time ago by a man who's the author of the NICHD protocol. Uh, he, he took a, or they had 21 trained forensic interviewer, interviewers, and they um, identified 96 interviews that these 21 interviewers had done prior uh, to, to training, and then matched and compared them to um, 96 interviews the same interviewers did after the uh, training had been completed. So it was a way to try to isolate the impact or the helpfulness or unhelpfulness of the training. And the way they measured um, uh, any change was by taking the transcripts of the interviews and coding them for question types. Um, open, so were they using open questions, um, direct questions, sort of closed questions, or suggestive or leading questions. And then they tabulated as well the number of details that the kids provided in response to the question types. Um, and then the premise was really the higher quality forensic interviews would have more open-ended prompts. Um, and would have kids providing details, more details in response to the open-ended prompts. So these 21 interviewers were split into four different training conditions. The first one was week-long classroom training, where they were just provided with information around child development, 
uh, but a particular forensic interviewing protocol wasn't described. The second training condition was a two-day training where they were introduced to a structural, structured forensic interviewing protocol such as NICHD or the NCAC one or Tom Yule Stepwise, and they were really instructed in the use of using and um, uh, exhausting open-ended questions. In the third training condition, they were given the two-day training again around learning a structured protocol. They did simulated interviews. And then each of the interviewers in that condition for a number of months, or for a number of weeks received both written and verbal feedback on their interviews. And then they participated in a monthly group feedback meeting um, where they would show, show their interviews in a group setting and receive feedback from their uh, colleagues. And then the last training condition, again, they were trained on a structured protocol and participated in the monthly group feedback meetings. Uh, so group four did not get the individual written um, and verbal feedback. So the findings were that uh, the greatest compliance with the protocol or the highest quality forensic interviewers were found um, in, uh, related to the interviewers that had participated in the third and the fourth training groups. Um, what they um, and what they also found is that there was actually no significant difference in the quality of the interviews between the third and the fourth training group, which the implication really was that it was the monthly day-long group meetings uh, um, surrounded by colleagues and peers, which seemed to um, provide interviewers with the most assistance around maintaining their skill and that the individual um, written and verbal feedback was not necessarily of any greater help for, for interviewers. Uh, second study, similar kind of ideas where they had eight forensic interviewers, 37 um, uh, interviews were picked from these eight, interviewer, from these eight interviewers. Um, during um, uh, the first 37 interviews, during that time, interviewers were receiving specific supervision and feedback, and then they matched those 37 interviews with 37 other interviews after supervision and feedback had been completed. And again, not surprising, what they found is once the supervision and the feedback ended, a significant decline in the use of open-ended questions and that more suggestive, closed-ended questions, yes, no questions, multiple choice questions were increased and introduced earlier in the interview. So the um, study authors indicated here that the re results reported here suggest that in the absence of ongoing supervision and opportunities to re-examine their interviews closely, investigators tend to fall back on older, less desirable, and less effective techniques. Bad habits, in other words. Continued discussion and problem solving within groups of investigators might have helped interviewers maintain superior interview practices, providing a less costly but effective means of maintaining the quality of investigative interviews. So I don't think, I don't think what we saw is that people completely lost their knowledge around you know, the protocol, understanding obviously there's that pre-substantive part, introductory, ground rules, practice interview, the transition to substantive. So what wasn't clear, what wasn't evident was that people lost all knowledge and skill, um, but what happened clearly in these two studies is that the types of prompts um, significantly changed without people reflecting back and getting feedback on their interviews. Now, I'm going to kind of suggest that I, I, I have a theory, <laughs> this is my theory about why, uh, you know, this, this may have happened. So this was a, a study, not a study, sorry, it was an article initially in the National Post a couple of years ago, actually now almost three years ago. The headline was, police interviewing children tend to ask largely inappropriate questions which lead to the wrongful conviction study. I read the article, it didn't really say very much, so I pulled, I found the study and I pulled the study. It was actually a Canadian study uh, done out in Newfoundland. 
Um, and it involved um, interviews of children uh, between ages three and seven related to some of these, um, the, you know, some of the crimes listed uh, here. And the officers, these were police officers who were conducting the interviews, had, they were not trained to interview children. Um, they were not trained on the NICHD protocol or Tom, Tom, Tom Lyons 10 staff or anything. They were trained on the PEACE model for interviewing adults. And so what they did is they took those 45 interviews, transcribed them, coded all of the prompts. And this to me, I believe, is sort of a good baseline for how I think adults typically talk to children. So what they found is that about 7% of the questions asked by the officers were open-ended, 31 directives, so these are your WH questions, and then almost 40%, so definitely the majority of questions um, in this distribution were considered closed or focused. So these are the yes-no questions and the multiple choice questions. And I really think, you know, especially when we're in there interviewing little five-year-old Sally, that we often feel, given their limited language skills, communication skills, cognitive skills, that we have to help them out quite a bit. And do we getting them to narrate using the open-ended questions is not the way we typically interact and talk with kids. So I think when we um, get get into less desirable forensic interviewing um, situations, I think we're often falling back on these natural inclinations. Again, Tom Lyon makes the same point. So research examining typical investigative interviews found that many of the most suggestive techniques are uncommon. So we've really, that message has uh, been um, shouted from the rooftops for many years around avoiding suggestive and leading questions and we've heard that, we've absorbed it, we're not doing it anymore. But rather, he says, online, that the primary problem with most interviews is that only can be predominantly closed-ended questions, which aren't highly leading, but give us less complete and less accurate reports from kids. Um, third Study. Um, this is actually another Canadian-based study that was done uh, in Ottawa with 13 different interviewers. Um, I don't know if there's anyone on the call from Ottawa who might even have participated or know of this study. Um, so these are interviewers who were given uh, a two or attended a two-day workshop on child development and interviewing techniques. They then every other week submitted uh, a transcript. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if it was a transcript and a video um, of one of their interviews, and they were given written and verbal individual feedback for a period of eight months. Two months after the two-day workshop, there was a sort of a booster refresher training provided. And the findings in the study, again, by going back and coding the interviews and looking at prompt types and so forth, were, again, that it was after the booster session, after the refresher training, where the study authors found that interviewers were able to improve the quality of their interviews, again, with the open-ended questions. So the sort of conclusion here is that maybe there's something to be said about space learning um, in helping interviewers retain uh, the knowledge and the skills from training. The cramming effect that maybe some of us have used in our previous university lives has uh, uh, maybe shown not to be particularly effective for forensic interviewers. And then lastly, this is just a quick study done by Tom Lyons, 2015, uh, these were 19 law students who were part of a course learning uh, child friends interviewing. Uh, they had to interview a child uh, for 10 weeks, uh, once, a, once a week, so they had to do 10 different interviews. Um, and again, they participated every week in one hour self-review and then a one hour peer review. Um, where they were looking at both transcripts as well as their video. And again, what they found over the 10-week period of time was an increase in the use of open invitations and a decrease in the option posing the yes-no multiple choice questions. But what was very clear is that, the, that this change occurred um, over time.
All right, so that's it for research. I'm sorry, I hate to interrupt, but uh, I just walked into an empty room and heard this on the speakerphone. Yeah, I'm from Cornwall. Can you tell me who might have been on this slide? Um, this is a webinar that's being run by the National uh, Children's Advocacy Center group. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. I will disconnect. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. That was fun. Okay. <laughs> Exciting. Um, so, what's fairly clear from the research, um, and I would, I would suggest, I think this rings true from a practice-based point of view as well, is that really getting to the point of higher quality and good quality forensic interviewing. It's, you know, initial training using in a structured protocol, but the piece that I want to kind of suggest that I think our field is still really grappling with is that the real importance of ongoing and continuous feedback for interviewers after uh, their initial training when they're actually doing their work. Um, I would suspect that most people are somewhat familiar with the National Children's Alliance down in the United States, which is the, the body responsible for accreditation of children's advocacy centers down in the U.S. Um, so this is, um, uh, I pulled this from their recent standards for accreditation, and it's uh, effective through to this year. Um, what's clear is that there's a expectation that any forensic interviewer at a CAC participate in peer review um, a minimum of two uh, you know people can have a read Search article, policy paper, so forth. Maybe um, so it's interesting. Language here is that this is adapted for the purposes of quality assurance uh, versus professional development, which might be a okay. What type of feedback? Uh, uh, might be available for forensic interviewers. Um, and just before I do this, I wanted to talk about documentation of forensic interviews. I'm going to make the assumption that if not everybody video and audio records all of their forensic interviews. Uh, I know that um, I went down to the progressive state of Alabama uh, in 2001, so about 16 years ago, to do some training through the NCAC group. And they were actually really surprised to hear at that point that we were pretty routinely doing um, all video and audio recording for all of our interviews. So I get the sense that we're sort of ahead of the, the curve a little bit on, in terms of the U.S. on this one. But I think it goes without saying that really the the, the standard for documenting forensic interviews is, is video and audio recording. Um, sometimes I know people will take in a handheld audio record just to have a backup in case something goes wrong. Um, taking notes during forensic interviews, um, again, in, in my sense, I, I think take, note taking is, first of all, sub, subject to our what can sometimes be unconscious bias <laughs> as we're sitting there in the room. It's also multitasking. So at the forensic interview, I don't know about other people who are on this call, but my mind's going a million miles a minute when I'm in that room talking to that kid. I'm actively trying to listen to what they say. I'm trying to think about what's the next question. What do I have to go back to to clarify? How do I make this kid, how do I keep the kid engaged? All these things are going through my head. So note taking would be might just push me over the edge. Um, and um, I, I, I've seen it in a number of interviews where it can be somewhat distracting uh, for kids as well if you're sitting there taking. Using a transcript um, has its advantages and its disadvantages. Obviously, the advantage of a transcript is that if you want to do that tracking piece around coding your responses to know 
how well you're doing at exhausting the open-ended questions is helpful, but obviously a transcript is not going to capture that nonverbal communication um, that you and that, that exists between you and that particular child. So pacing of your interview, of your voice, the tone of your voice, your body positioning, any actions that you're doing, the child is doing, is not going to get obviously captured on a, on a transcript. Okay, so um, I'm just going to go through four different sort of type of feedback. Um, and again, I, you know, for centers that have gone sort of more specialized or designated forensic interviewing model, Supervision or consultation may make more sense because there isn't the group of peers that are doing the work. Um, I mean, supervision I, by definition is usually a one-on-one -on -one interaction with a more experienced forensic interviewer and a, a newly or less trained experience, uh, experienced forensic interview. And it may or may not, it typically does um, uh, include an assessment of the interviewer's performance for quality assurance purposes. Um, so again, some advantages and disadvantages. Obviously, if it's a newer interviewer, there's certain advantages in that the feedback can be very specific and tailored to the specific needs of that learner, of that interviewer, and perhaps they have longer to go on their learning curve, and so the more feedback they can get individually, the better in terms of them progressing. Uh, supervision does often allow um, some monitoring of whether feedback is implemented back into practice uh, on behalf um, by the interviewer. And the issue of confidentiality, so bearing your soul, saying that you're really struggling in the area of keeping the questions developmentally appropriate, or perhaps you recognize that you over rapport build with it child being open and vulnerable to talk about where you think you struggle and where your challenges are uh, in a supervision kind of setting uh, may be a little bit a little bit better um, because um, there are only two people in the room so confidentiality can be assured uh, more so than sitting you know with uh, a dozen of your peers obviously supervision puts a bit of a strain on human resources and if it's tied to performance, um, you may get an interviewer who's less honest or less willing to sort of engage. Consultation, so again, a one-on-one -on -one interaction where typically it's an individual that's external to the organization where the interviewer is working. So this individual has specialized knowledge or skill and will give advice and feedback to assist the interviewer. Typically, although this isn't always the case, consultation isn't necessarily tied into performance evaluation and appraisal. Again, some pros um, being not tied to performance, it might make that interviewer more honest, more frank, more candid about where they see their strengths or their weaknesses, can be tailored to individual needs. Um, again, not the risks around being vulnerable with colleagues because it's sort of one person you're working with who can, you know, typically ensure confidentiality. Some of the drawbacks of consultation, of course, is that it can be very costly and not just, it might not be a possibility for people in particular communities based on their resources. And a consultation model doesn't necessarily have that feedback loop to figure out if some of the recommendations around the feedback have been implemented into practice. Self-review, so this is basically Officer Jimmy, Jimmy coming back from his uh, investigation, um, you know, then a week later, sitting down and thinking, you know, I really, I, I struggled kind of idea, you know, where I struggled or where I didn't struggle. Um, again, some of the uh, Advantages are that, you know, no strain on human resources, um, easy to implement, no meetings, no coordination. Um, some of the drawbacks, though, are, you know, whether we, me, myself, and I is the best person to be objective uh, at looking at my work. And again, whether we have these unconscious biases in our, in our head. My experience is I typically come out of a forensic interview and I usually 
I usually am beating myself up. I didn't do this well. I didn't do that well. I missed this. I should have gone back to that. And it's actually often more helpful for me to watch back the interview, and I feel better after I've watched it back, um, more in the, in the context of trying to understand what went well and didn't go well. Um, one of the other drawbacks of a self-review, though, is that um, I, I don't know about other people's organizations, but it, there's not typically built-in time into your workday. You're um, being handed another case, and you're out the door to do another investigation. Um, so we don't technically structure that into people's days. And then, again, limited accountability to change practice because it's, again, you yourself and you that are doing the, the reviewing. Um, if people are doing self-review, and I'm not going to discourage self-review, I think there could, I do it all the time. Um, and what I usually do is I try to use one of these uh, sheets that help me have some kind of structured, systematic way, objective way at looking at my interview. So this is a peer review sheet developed by Tom Lyon. And uh, it's quite simple to read. You just basically code your prompts in these three different areas, and then you use a check or an X, depending on whether you get a one-word answer or a multiple-word answer. So at the end of the interview, you know, you might watch your interview and you think, oh, my gosh, oh, yeah, I asked lots of open-ended questions. The kid gave me all kinds of narrative, and I kept, you know, asking for more elaboration with tell me more about that, and then what happened next? But if, uh, if people go through this exercise, I find that uh, um, things can look a little bit different systematically, and uh, often a lot of checks and Xs end up in that WH uh, section as opposed to the open-ended questions. So this is one that, that Tom Lyon has created. This one is one done by a psychologist down the States named Erna Olison, which is more of a checklist kind of thing around whether or not you've been true to the protocol. Um, and uh, adhered to the different phases of the protocol, and then on the right side allows you to add some comments in. People are interested in getting a hard copy of some of these things because it's on the PowerPoint side here. I'd be happy to send that, or Sydney could help me send that through to the group. Okay, peer review. So this is really a facilitated discussion with other interviewers or team members who are also doing uh, forensic interviewing. You know, I think what's really important here is peer review. So peer meaning that these are people, other people who are doing the same work. And it's really a process of looking at your practice with your peers. Um, it's really intended to be a formalized process, so not like, hey guys, let's, uh, over lunch, let's throw on a DVD and look at, uh, look at this interview. Well, that was kind of tricky for me. Um, meant to be done in a neutral environment with established group norms and, and obviously shared understanding of goals, processes, and purpose. I will kind of make that a little bit more practical when I talk about what we've done here uh, in Toronto. Again, pros and cons. Um, I don't, I, I actually, every single time I participated in a peer review session, which I've done here in Toronto, but I've been doing for a number of years through the National Children's Alliance with a bunch of state sites down in the U.S. I come away always with an, another idea about something I'm going to do or something I'm not going to do in a forensic interview. And I find it really interesting to hear other people's perspectives. Um, and I have to say, again, for those of you people who have to go to court and sit <laughs> in the witness stand and watch your interview, you in front of the whole court, I find that a peer review setting where you're doing something similar, obviously obviously less intimidating because it's your peers, but it is a way of uh, preparing for these other types of situations that you're going to be in as a forensic interview. Uh, not tied to performance, peer review isn't supposed to be um, a type of evaluation or appraisal that's tied to your performance. Um, and then cons, uh, some of the drawbacks. Um, the bottom line is that, again, in a setting of 12, 15, 10 people, being able to say, I really struggled with this interview, this was tricky, that was tricky, it, it takes, obviously, it's, it's, risk, it's a risk for people to sometimes uh, uh, talk about that. 
and look vulnerable. I, I want to say just as it's vulnerable to be the person bringing the DVD, what I found in Toronto based on my conversations with people who participated is that as a reviewee, so as a person sitting in the room deciding about whether you're going to give feedback to your colleague or what that feedback is going to be, that it can be challenging as well because this is the person you sit by day in and day out. This is the person you work with day in and day out and deciding about, you know, whether or not to give constructive criticism uh, can, can be pretty tricky for some people. Um, not tailored to individual training or learning needs because it's more of a group setting. Um, limited monitoring in terms of uh, that feedback loop to see if uh, changes are happening in practice. And just that idea, again, that discomfort that a lot of people talk about around watching themselves on video in, with a group of people. I've heard people refer to it as the cringe factor. All I can say is you just keep doing it and doing it and you get desensitized to it and eventually the cringe factor goes away. But a lot of people talk about that initially, that that's, that's a bit of a hurdle. Okay, so I'm now going to just talk a little bit about what we've done in Toronto over the last two years and um, and then um, hopefully um, the, there may be some people who can offer some of their ideas and uh, lessons learned in their particular communities. So the timeline looks like this here in Toronto. So prior to the CYC opening here, the police and the CAS, remember uh, we have a generalist model here, so there were about close to 30 police and CAS or child welfare staff who actually received some initial forensic interviewee training through the National Children's Advocacy Center. It was a three-day training here in Toronto. Uh, the CYAC opened in October 2013. In December, uh, there was a model for peer review uh, proposed to management. Um, at that point, a small working group was created um, among uh, supervisors and staff uh, and myself. Uh, we then sort of fleshed out the process, uh, answered some important questions, and then re-proposed it back to our joint management team for approval. And then in October 2014, uh, the process goals uh, of the program and so forth were introduced to the police and child welfare staff. And then November and December 2014, we did two pilot peer review sessions, which were, were my interviews. And then in February 2015, so two years ago, we started uh, formally uh, with uh, peer review. The guiding principles that were set out right from the beginning uh, were, most importantly, there is no such thing as a perfect forensic interview, and you're not being held to an unrealistic standard. You're not being judged as a human being. <laughs> um, that we, again, encourage people to be open-minded and listen to the guidance and that there was not going to be a case where people's work was going to be compromised on their cases, whether it was um, as they took, the, took it before the criminal courts or the family courts. Um, we really kind of tried to suggest that um, this wasn't about defending your interview. It was really about looking at other options, other ideas that people would have. So for next time you're in that inset situation in an interview, you just may have some more options and some more choices around how you respond. I think the other important thing to say is that some people might disagree with me and I have to say I am quite um, uh, narrow-minded when it comes to this, but I do think the forensic interviewing component of the of the investigation is one of the most challenging parts of the investigation. I think it's very skill-based, um, and I think it's, in my mind, that specialized skill. Um, when interview, when um, people in peer review are giving feedback, the again, the uh, guiding principle was that feedback should be given in terms of overall impressions, recommendations for improvement, so areas where maybe interviewers were challenged or struggled, which would then be um, uh, coupled with a discussion of interviewer strengths that were noted. 
And then really the importance of protecting your colleagues' right to confidentiality. So what's talked about in the room stays in the room, doesn't uh, travel outside of the peer review room. So in terms of case selection, it was determined that the the officer or the children's day worker that brought the find that that to session uh, would pick um, the interview, an interview that they found to be challenging. So I'm pretty clear with people. I don't, you know, the interview where they walk in and 11 year old Johnny is developmentally quite advanced, is motivated to tell about. The physical abuse he's just uh, suffered. He's articulate about it. Out it comes. You walk go through your forensic interviewing protocol. It's not those interviews that I really wanted people to bring or think about bringing. It was really more the cases where people struggled and it was challenging and some more discussion and feedback around what else could I have done uh, would have been of some help for, for, uh, for them. The issue of consent in terms of using the DVDs or the video recordings. So this was actually a long discussion that we had as a small group and then um, quite a long discussion with our joint management team here. And that really is, um, A, do we need to obtain informed consent from uh, families or kids to use DVDs? Um, and if so, how should we go about doing that? So what we really decided on was, um, we did get a legal opinion at, at some point, which I'll talk, talk about, but what we decided on is developing a separate consent form, which we would use, uh, which the individual officer or the worker who was bringing the DVD to peer review would use um, in order to, uh, to bring that DVD. Um, I'll show you the consent form in a minute. Um, we also agree that in, in a number of cases that have come to peer review, these are cases that are some weeks or months past the investigation stage. Um, so um, officers or workers may not have had contact with the family for a number of weeks or months. Um, and there was some kind of discomfort around officers going out and showing up at people's home and getting them to sign this consent form. So we did agree that people could, if they aren't having a face-to-face -face with that family, that they could obtain um, informed consent over the telephone, verbally from the parent, caregiver, or youth, and then document that in, in writing, and that would be an acceptable way of obtaining that informed consent. So this is what our consent form has ended up looking like. I couldn't fit it all on the PowerPoint slide. So at the bottom, what's missing is basically just a little paragraph saying that at any time the uh, family could uh, decide to withdraw their consent by contacting somebody at the CYAC and that wouldn't affect the services they receive from the CYAC in any, in any way. So you can see it's pretty typical consent, it's just basically outlining the partners um, that are involved and um, what it is that um, we're asking of, of the family or of the youth. Um, I developed this script that the staff could use when they are obtaining consent from families. Again, just really outlining that um, in order to maintain good practice around forensic interviewing. Um, we recognize that for ongoing continuous review beyond initial training and that um, their DVD would be shown among a group of 12 to 15 other investigators um, as a way uh, to, you know, in, ensure good skill and learning opportunities. Group size. So um, initially, uh, when it first started, we had six groups, uh, no, sorry, four groups of six to eight people um, with child welfare and police officers being mixed together. And each group was had a supervisor that was either a child welfare supervisor or a police supervisor. About six months into the peer review, I, I made the discussion and consultation with some of the supervisor staff that 
we would collapse the four, four groups to two groups, which ended us up with about 15 to 17 staff and two supervisors per group. Um, and what happened, surprisingly, is the attendance significantly improved when we changed the sizes of the groups. Um, and I don't know, I, the only thing I can think of is that maybe there was safety <laughs> numbers and people felt more comfortable to be in a bigger group. Um, someone else would be offering feedback or suggestions so they wouldn't feel so on the spot. I'm not sure. That's just, again, another one of my theories. Um, but certainly, it's now been a year and a half where we've had this group size and it really has, uh, the attendance actually has been quite good. I, I think the bottom line is, and I recognize this, is that, you know, these are people that are, are pretty busy uh, in various, uh, working various cases at various points in investigations. Peer review in many ways comes fairly close to the bottom of the totem pole. Um, and and I, I recognize that, um, court appearances, going out on a new investigation, attending other training, all of these things will often get in the way. But I have to say we've had um, really quite good attendance over the last year and a half. Um, the decision around supervisors participating in the peer review sessions um, it was pretty, ex we were pretty explicit around the fact that, again, they were participating not to tie the work to performance, but as uh, another uh, person who would be providing feedback um, in the group setting. Frequency of peer review, um, I mean, this decision was really based on sort of, <laughs> quite frankly, the availability that I had and the reality that we didn't want to put a big strain time-wise um, on peer review given all the other demands for these people's attention. So at present, we meet, each peer review team meets every other month. So in any given calendar year, there are six peer review sessions that the um, police officer or child welfare worker will attend. Um, the officers and workers are invited to attend the, attend the off month if they wish, and actually a few people have, some of the keeners have, and so they've come, you know, more than six times a year. In terms of documentation, um, so as a facilitator, I do document. The documentation that I do stays with me. It does not become part of the file uh, here at the CYAC. It doesn't become part of the police file. It doesn't become, become part of the child welfare file. Um, it, it, it remains completely separate, and there's sort of good rationale for that. Um, one of the you know, main reasons being that um, if there are subsequent uh, criminal court involvements or family court involvements, um, we see this as more a professional development quality assurance part of a process which really shouldn't be in the, the live case file and should not be subpoenaed, subpoenable um, uh, in future court settings. So what I document is the date of the peer review, who's in attendance, the name of the worker officer presenting, age of the child, very brief unidentifying case history. I summarize the comments and feedback that the feedback the group has provided, and then note kind of the themes of the feedback. I then indicate whether or not I've distributed any correspondence, um, like position papers, research articles. So, you know, I've there was a position paper by NCAC in terms of interviewing preschoolers. Uh, I recently gave out Tom Lyon's new uh, research article on questioning children about clothing placement. Um, we also had a peer review session where one of the big struggles was how to engage uh, particularly reluctant kids. So I distributed the NICHD adapted protocol for interviewing reluctant and reticent children. Um, so that's all documented as well. At the outset, I also, um, in the course of the peer review, uh, every person there got a copy of this feedback form. Um, and you can see it here. Again, it, it's really just going through and, again, seeing around the fidelity to a forensic interviewing protocol with, a, you know, some 
some room at the bottom for com general comments. I'm sorry that it got kind of cut off as well on the PowerPoint slide. So I distributed this about three times, and at the end of each of those three peer review sessions, I got them back with absolutely not one letter on any <laughs> one of them. <laughs> so it, it, it clearly was something that was not embraced. It was not utilized. Again, my thinking because of my involvement in other peer review uh, groups was that if people did not feel it was the right uh, setting to be given uh, information verbally, that perhaps this was another medium that people could put down their ideas and their thoughts and their comments. I'm looking to rethink this and maybe reintroduce this soon. Okay, so in terms of what actually happens in our peer review process, um, the officer or worker um, who's showing their DVD provides initially a very brief case history, um, you know, what the allegation or concern, how it came to the CYAC, um, and, uh, you know, any information that was sort of learned uh, before the interview was done. And then um, they will hopefully have identified specific questions for the group to respond to. So I really struggled with this kid around inattentive, the child being inattentive, and I didn't seem to be able to engage. What what suggestions would you have for me? Uh, you know, at the at the end of the uh, at the end of the interview, um, and then what we have started to do, not started at, right from the get go, I I implemented this uh, approach is the facilitator. So that's myself sits typically beside the investigator who's brought the DVD. We run, we turn the DVD on, we start the interview, and at any given time, either the officer, worker, or myself can stop the DVD and say, turn to the group and say, what would you do next? What would you say? What would be your next question? I participate in a peer review group through the National Children's Alliance Center where the method is different. The DVD is turned on and it's shown in its entirety. And then the moderator goes site to site to get feedback for the interviewer. What I find happens with that approach is number one, I often will forget <laughs> information, questions that come up, feedback I might have you know, by the time the interview's done. So stuff that I thought of earlier in the interview has left my mind and I haven't taken note of it um, by, you know, by the end. So I, I, I think that's one reason that this other, I, I thought this other approach might be helpful. I mean, the other thing that I find it happens is when we, when the interview is stopped, it's usually in one of those really kind of difficult times in an interview, and you turn to the group and say, okay, what question? Nobody, like, shoots up their hand and has an immediate response. These are usually difficult questions, and I think it kind of brings home the message that, you know, we're all in this together. At some point or another, you're going to be in an interview situation like that, and you're going to have that difficult situation, and you're going to tr you're going to have to provide a response or manage it in a particular way. So this isn't about this one particular officer or this one particular worker that we're going to put under the microscope. This is about all of us who are doing this work that we're going to be coming across these things. Um, and so, as opposed to you know, you know, again and feeling that all the attention is on that one particular officer or worker, it's more of a we're all in this together and uh, let's generate some ideas about what we would do in that situation. So over the last two years, um, there, we've completed, there have been 24, 24 peer review sessions. Uh, five sessions were canceled due to low numbers or the presenting worker was unavailable. Just for the first six months when we had four groups, we were actually running peer review um, twice a month versus once a month. And that's why, you know, that math doesn't completely add up because it looks like we were doing one, one a month, which again, we've averaged to do that about once a month. So some of the themes that I went back over the documentation and then looked at the themes that got 
identified and highlighted through our peer review sessions. I've sort of listed here, so managing reluctance. How do you solicit disclosure? How do you uh, adapt or approach the issue of assessing or understanding emotional harm? It was a very interesting case. Um, adapting your interview approach for a 12-year-old who who's on the um, autism spectrum. Um, how do you separate multiple incidents? So when a child comes in and is either talking, is a sort of the issue is polyvictimization or there have been multiple incidents, how do you do that? Having this debate about when has an interviewer exhausted open-ended questions? You know, this is our best practice. This is what we're told to do in the substantive part of our interview. In my mind, this is often so subjective and so case dependent. So this has been a really good discussion a couple of times with people saying, no, well, I would still ask this, or gosh, I think you were done exploring that issue, you know, five questions ago. Um, and this is the reason why. Uh, use of interview aids, like diagrams. How much context detail is really important to collect? And how might your approach change as a forensic interview where you're interviewing a child where concerns have been raised not based on a disclosure but based on behavior or other sort of risk factors? Should we incorporate sexual abuse prevention into our forensic interviews? Should we routinely be screening for sexual exploitation at some point during our forensic interviews? Is there such a thing as over rapport building? Um, oh, this was an interesting case. This was a, I remember a interview that came where little Sally came in the room and before I think the officer and the little Sally was seated, Sally piped up and said, oh, I have to tell you what my daddy did to me and out came the disclosure. And so we had an interesting discussion there around how do you manage that as a forensic interview? Do you go back to protocol and say, thanks for telling me that, Sally. First, I want to, you know, make sure we have a couple of things figured out, and then we'll go back and talk about daddy. Or, or do you, just, you know, pr promote or, or have the child provide further disclosure? How do you conduct effective joint forensic interviews? Responding to fantastical statements in interviews, crazy things kids are going to tell us sometimes had a, a case come where it was a four-year-old girl um, who um, uh, English was not her first language, so the use of an interpreter, adapting interviews for preschoolers, and how should we be doing things differently or perhaps the same um, when we're interviewing following a recantation. So again, those are just some of the themes that I sort of pulled out over the last couple of years of our peer review. All right, so some lessons learned. Um, what seems to have been fairly clear, as I said, is sort of this group size of 12 to 15 seems sort of optimal in terms of um, people coming, people showing up. The stop and start of the DVD, uh, reducing the interviewer feeling under the microscope, um, were, this idea we're all in this together, you'll find yourself in this situation one day, I think has been really helpful. And I also think it really makes people think. Like they're not just gonna sit there and say, Oh, you did a good you did a good interview or that wasn't such a good interview. They actually have to think in a moment of an applied, you know, you know, what it is they would do, what question they would ask or not ask. Um, it was clear to me that my my little checklist for written feedback was well utilized. Um, I am going to take another stab at that. The other lesson learned from my perspective is for the first year, I um, I uh, relied on um, people to volunteer to bring a, a DVD for peer review. And I, I got a few volunteers. <laughs> But I also had a lot of phone calling to do and pleading and begging and harassing. And so over the last year, um, what I have done is do an assignment a year in advance. So people are assigned to a particular month to bring their DVD, which gives them hopefully enough time to find the right DVD that they want to bring. I think it really, you need some kind of committed leader or facilitator to, to get get a process like this off the ground. I also found that um, scheduling the peer reviews early in the day 
I think are probably pretty key because, again, these are people who are going to get handed uh, an investigation oftentimes earlier in the day or things blow up as the day goes on. And so getting, uh, getting this done as early as possible to make sure people can attend seems to have been helpful. And of course, we've had you know staff turnover here, so sort of thinking through a strategy around um, staff turnover and in introducing people to the peer review process uh, who come in um, and are new. And so, in fact, might really have different learning needs um, around maintaining and improving their forensic interview skills. So, the lesson learned there is I haven't you know we haven't sort of figured that piece out yet. Um, okay, so I thought I'd be about an hour, and I've been about an hour. That's the material that I've prepared. Um, so I am happy to take any questions at this point. Uh, so maybe we'll start with that. If people have any questions based on the material I've uh, presented. You didn't get any chats, okay. Okay, it doesn't sound like there's any questions. Um, so, uh, just, uh, so I, I don't know if, could we go site to site and see if people could give uh, the group some information around whether they're at the beginning stages of this issue, whether they've got something up and running in terms of supervision, consultation, peer review, um, and again, any lessons learned. Can you call up the site? Um. Okay, so scare them. I think I scared everybody away. So we don't want to plug in now? Okay, so the project link, links? Does anybody want to talk about where you guys are at? Hi, my name is I'm the community. Okay? Yep. Okay, good. Um, I'm the coordinator for Project Link, so the lead here for our Child Advocacy Center, which is a virtual center. Um, so yes. my my area of work is not in forensic interviewing, so I, I set this up in order for our Child Protection and our CMP and any other um, multidisciplinary team partners to join in. So um, no, I don't really have much to add because it, uh, it, it would be better if somebody else um, in that area. <laughs> okay. Do you, is there anything in place that you're aware of at this point in terms of peer review or? Um, I can't speak about that in, in any kind of, uh, yeah, there's a joint investigation protocol between Family and Children's Services and RCMP, um, and part of that includes, um, you know, training and, um, Mentorship, I guess, but no, it, I I can't really speak with any authority on that. Um, okay. We have another member on the line, I, I think, Ian, um, who is one of our regional social workers. So maybe when you get down the line to him, he he would be able to speak about it with more detail. Um, at this point, I don't know that there is a solid, structured peer review process in Whitehorse or throughout the communities and across the territory. Um, but there may be something in place that is not practiced. There may be something that is coming into place. Um, there might be something that people do in specific communities that I'm not aware of. Um, yeah, so I, I can't really say. Okay, thanks. 
Thanks for talking even with limited information. <laughs> in Quebec, said thank you for your presentation. We do have pilot in the province of Quebec in terms of peer reviews. It's under the leadership of Mirale uh, Sar, who implemented uh, MICHD in the province. Okay. Did everyone hear that? Pilot peer review. Anybody else? I'm Emma Hayward in uh, Science in England. Yes. Hi. Um, so I guess we're at the early stages at the moment. We're at the stages where we've trained our um, interviewers, and we've, we've trained two clinical psychologists to do the forensic interviewing, um, based on the Scandinavian model. Um, and we're just at the moment trying to work out what kinds of suitable sample review setup needs to be in place. But it's been really helpful hearing about your approach. Our um, criminal justice system are being uh, set down about wanting to see a really robust policy process in place before um, they're still confident about yeah. It's been really helpful. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Emma. Uh, Helene also, just to add to what it was that she said, so that she's heard very positive feedback from investigators, and her understanding is that it also includes ongoing training. Hmm. Any other sites? Okay. Well, thank you for uh, for those of you who uh, provided some some of your own uh, feedback and insights. I, it's exciting to hear that you know things are are starting this way. I I was talking to a colleague a couple of months ago who does a lot of um, uh, research in a field, uh, forensic interviewing, and her observation was that you know as as I talked about later that we're we're really close to consensus on what constitutes a a, a best practice forensic interview, but uh, perhaps we're a little bit, we're not quite as far ahead when it comes to understanding what that ongoing and continuous training or support needs to look like for forensic interviewers. So, um, you know, I think we're in that, that stage right now where, where that's getting, uh, getting sorted out. Um, so if there aren't any other questions, I think, um, I think we can um, uh, log off, but I'll just wait a minute uh, or a few seconds to see if anybody else has any other comments or questions. Okay, thanks for logging on today.